So this is the first question of this paper. One part. So one part A says state advertisement by work done. So let me just. So state work is meant by work done. So this is a pretty simple definition. So this is just the product of force and displacement moved in the direction of the force. In the direction of the force. Right, so saying this, that uh, this is the distance or the displacement moved in the direction of the force, uh, this is important. If you just write distance or displacement without specifying that this is in the direction of the force, you will not get the mark here. Right, so this is the first part, uh, relatively easy. B part one, uh, sorry, B uh, part B says, use the answer to A to determine the SI base units of power. Right, so power we know, is defined as the rate of work done. So I could use rate of energy transfer just as well, but since uh, this question is uh, explicitly, uh, explicitly asking me to use my answer to part A, so in part A, I wrote the answer to work done, so I'll continue to use this. So work done is the product of force and displacement divided by time. If you remember the uh, base units for force, uh, good for you. You can just use those here as well. If you don't, just like me. So if you are not used to memorizing these units, you can just derive these on uh, the spot. So force, if I think about Newton's second law, so that would be mass times acceleration times the displacement divided by time, right? So mass is kilograms. Fortunately, I do remember the base units for acceleration, which are meter per second square, and S uh, is displacement, so that is in meters, right? And time is in seconds, right? So mass in kgs, acceleration in meter per second square, and uh, the displacement in meters divided by the time, which is in seconds. So just in case if it's confusing to any of you, I just uh, cleared up which uh, unit is for which quantity. So if I just simplify this, so the numerator would become kg meter square per second square. And then I have this divided by a second. So when this would go up, so this would become S minus one. So this would become S minus two minus one. So that just becomes kg m square remains as it is. And S becomes minus three, right? So that was part B, this is also pretty straightforward. Part C, so the maximum useful output power P of a car traveling on a horizontal road is given by this equation, P equals V cubed times B, uh, where V is the maximum speed of the car and B is a constant. For the car, P equals 84 kilowatts plus or minus 5%. So the actual value along with its uncertainty and the constant B is also, uh, also has some value and it also has some uncertainty. The units are not spread, uh, specified here, but we know that this is in SI units. So when we have to calculate the value of V, so obviously we would use this formula, but for B, we don't have to worry about the conversions because we are told this is already in SI units, right? So if I have to calculate the value of V, so this would just be, uh, so V cube, so re rearranging the equation above, this becomes P upon B, right? So P is 84 kilowatts. So this can be written as 84 into 10 to the three divided by B, which is 0 0.56, right? So from here you can get V cube 
And then you simply do this, that whatever your answer is, you take the square uh, cube root of that answer. So V turns out to be 53 meters per second corrected to SF. Let me just double check this with my calculator. Just when I need to grab my calculator. So 84,000 upon 0 0.56, this is uh, 150,000, right? And then you take the square root, uh, cube root of this. So this turns out to be 53.13, which correct to 2SF is just 53 meters per second, right? So this answer is correct as well. Determine the absolute uncertainty in the value of V, right? So if you have to find the absolute uncertainty, so if you think about the formula we used, so we have P upon B, right? And this is equal to V cube. So if I try to write this formula entirely in terms of with V as the subject and not V cube, so this would become cube root P upon B, right? So when I think about calculating the uncertainties, so I know that whenever quantities are being multiplied or divided, then their percentage uncertainties are added, right? So I have the percentage uncertainties above. So what's going to happen is when I'm going to talk about the, un, uh, the uncertainty in V, so that would be the percentage uncertainty in P plus the percentage uncertainty in V, but because of this cube root here, so cube roots we know are basically powers of one third, just like square roots are powers of half. So cube root can be written as a power of one third. So this uncertainty would be actually multiplied by one upon three, right? Because this entire fraction is raised to one by three. So now if I uh, talk about the percentage uncertainty, so this is 5% for P, 7% for B, and I divide this by three. So five plus seven is 12 upon three is four. So 4% 4 is the uh, percentage uncertainty in V. Now I needed to calculate the absolute uncertainty. So let me just take 4% of this 53. So 4% 4, 4 of 53. So this is simply 0 0.04 times 53. So this turns out to be 2.12. But if I think about it, this is the absolute uncertainty, right? So absolute uncertainties are always written correct to one SF. So this simply becomes two meters per second, right? So that concludes this question. Now let's go on to question number two. So question number two says, a spherical balloon is filled with a fixed mass of gas. A small block is connected by a string to the balloon as shown in figure 2.1. Right? 
right? So this is the balloon, which has uh, some gas in it. And by a string, it's connected to a block, uh, which is resting on the ground. So the block is held on the ground by an external force so that the string is vertical, right? So there is some force, there are some forces acting on this entire system. So we obviously know there's going to be some weight as well. There is going to be tension in the string. And if we just read on, the density of the air surrounding the balloon is 1.2 kilogram per meter cube. The upthrust acting on the balloon is 0 0.071 newtons. So if you think about this, so since upthrust uh, is mentioned, and we usually think about upthrust in terms of liquids, so let me just draw a sort of an analogy for you here. So let's say that this is basically the limit of the atmosphere, and this is all the air which is underneath it, right? So upthrust, and this is just a clarification for you guys, that upthrust is not only due to a liquid, but the collective uh, term should be that it is due to a fluid, right? So fluid is basically the umbrella term for both liquids and gases. So just like any liquid would exert an upthrust, similarly, gases would also exert an upthrust, right? Due to this density of the air. And again, as the word says, uh, upthrust is always upwards. So this upthrust would also be acting in the upward direction. The upthrust acting on the string and block is negligible, right? So here we are talking about the upthrust acting on the balloon. So as per the, so as per the uh, instructions by the examiner, we can ignore any upthrust uh, acting on the other two uh, components, which are the string and the block. By using Archimedes principle, calculate the radius R of the balloon. So Archimedes principle is simply this formula, which is the upthrust is given as the product of these terms, right? So this is the density of the medium, right? Not the density of the material of the balloon, but the density of the medium, which in this case is going to be the density of air, G, the gravitational field strength, and delta V is again, and the word I like to use. So this is the volume of the object, which is under the fluid, right? So this balloon, if uh, let's say, if this is like the limit of the atmosphere, right? So this is how far the Earth's atmosphere goes. Obviously a balloon of this small size is entirely under this atmosphere. So this entire volume is going to be substituted into this formula. Because otherwise, so if I would give you an example like this, so let's say if I had, so if this is my surface of the water, if I have a cube like this. So here, basically, when I'm talking about delta V, I would use this volume, which is the volume of the object under the water, right? So this is important to think about whenever talking about this formula. So here, the upthrust would be due to only this volume, which is actually beneath the surface of the water. Here, if you think about it, this entire balloon is beneath the, is under the influence of this fluid, right? Which is the air. So all of this is under the atmosphere. So this is just to reiterate that in this formula, I would take this entire volume of the balloon. So U, the upthrust is 0 0.071. Rho is 1.2. G is 9.81 in both AS and A2. And delta V is going to be the volume of this balloon, right? So here, if we need to calculate the radius of the balloons, the volume, so this balloon is actually spherical. So this is something you need to know. I've emphasized this, I don't know how many times now, that you need to recall the volume of a sphere. So this is given by four by three pi r cube. So four by three pi r cube, right? So the radius is what you need to find. So this is now pretty easy. You just make to uh, you just need to make 
the radius the subject of this equation. So let's do this. So this equation will simply become 0 0.071 times 3 upon 1.2 times 9.81 times 4 pi. This is just for you guys. Don't waste time in your exams doing this where you are writing down the steps for each individual uh, step. You are writing down values for each individual step, so no need to do this. So this is 1.44 into 10 to the negative 3. Just use the uh, value in your calculator and take the cube root. So this turns out to be 0 0.1129. So just to 2SF, this would be 0 0.11 meters. The next part, the total weight of the balloon string and block is 0 0.053 Newton. Right, so just as there was an upthrust, and upthrust by the name is always going to act upwards. So we know that there is another force here the weight of uh, these three things, which is 0 0.053. And this is something that we also know, which is that weight always acts downwards. So the external force holding the block on the ground is removed so that the released block is lifted up vertically upwards by the balloon. So previously, when we were looking at this uh, setup, so we were saying that there are going to be three forces. So obviously the upthrust, the weight, and there was also a third force which is the tension in the string, which was actually keeping the balloon and the block connected together. But now what happens is that this uh, setup is slightly changed. All right, so the setup is not changed. So there's uh, still some tension in that, but the external force, which is holding the block on the ground. So here you can imagine as, as if somebody actually had their finger on this block and that was holding this to the ground. So whatever this force is now removed, so what's going to happen is now there are two forces acting, right? So in this case, you can actually ignore tension. And the reason for this is pretty simple, which is that the examiner has not provided to you this. So you can think of this entire uh, balloon string and block setup as one entire body. So this is one body and one force acting on it was the 0 0.071 upwards, the other force is the 0 0.053 downwards, right? So that the release block is lifted vertically upwards by the balloon. Calculate the acceleration of the block immediately after it is released. So obviously there is going to be a net force here, right? So there is a difference in the forces upwards and downwards. So there's going to be a vertical resultant force. So if I think about this entire object, so there is a upward force of 0 0.071 Newtons, and there is a downward force of 0 0.053 Newtons. So all in all, if I think about it, there is going to be a resultant upward force because the force upward is greater than the force downwards, right? So there is a resultant force, obviously by Newton's second law, there will be some acceleration as well. So if I have to use F equals MA, which is Newton's second law, I would also need the mass. And the mass I can get from here. So since I know the weight, I can sim uh, simply use W equals MG to get the mass from here, right? So when I have to use uh, Newton's second law, so net force equals MA. So the net force would be 0 0.071 minus 0 0.053. This would be the net force. This would be equal to the mass of this uh, entire setup, which is the balloon string and the block. So weight divided by G is going to be the mass. And from this, I can calculate A, right? So 0 0.071 minus 0 0.053 divided by 0 0.053. So the acceleration turns out to be 3.331. Just to see 
three meters seconds. And I have been not a different not. It's all good. This part, in my opinion, is a bit more tricky. So the well continues to look the string moving vertically upward speed on the second. Okay. So as I was saying, Sorry, I don't know what just happened. Let me just share screen again. Yeah, I'm sorry, which part exactly? Can you just point me to that? I don't know exactly at which point did I disconnect. And is my voice okay now? Right, so let me just go up and I'll explain this. Yeah, so in this part, the fact I'm talking about is this. So the total weight of the balloon is given, right? So in part A, what you made use of was the fact that there is an upward force on the balloon, right? That was the upthrust. In this part, there is a weight on the balloon and this weight, we obviously know the weight is always downwards. So if I think about the different forces acting on this system, so there is a force of 0 0.071 upwards, a force of 0 0.053 downwards. So obviously the vertically, the forces are not balanced. So there is going to be a resultant force. And by Newton's second law, this means that there will be an acceleration as well. And this is exactly what the examiner has asked us to calculate, right? So if I have the resultant force and I need the acceleration, so I just need one more thing, which is the mass. And the mass I can get uh, from here, because if I think about this, this equation, there's an equation we know, which is W equals mg, right? So here you basically have W, so W upon G would then give you M. So that's all I did. And then I rearranged this equation to get the acceleration. Hope that helps. Yeah, this is just the net force, right? So since both of these forces are acting in opposite directions, so since obviously the force upward is going to be greater, so the object is going to accelerate upwards, right? So this is why I subtracted them because they're in opposite directions. So this is the part we were discussing. So the balloon, the balloon continues to lift the block. The string breaks as the block is moving vertically upwards with a speed of 1.4 meters per second. After the string breaks, the detached block briefly continues moving upwards before falling vertically downwards to the ground. The block hits the ground with a speed of 3.6 meters per second, right? So what is being told to us here is as this balloon was lifting the block up, the string breaks, right? And just at that instant, what happens is since this entire setup was moving at a speed of 1.4 meters per second, so since the brake is now disconnected from this entire thing, it is still, just for a short period of time, it is still moving upwards at a speed of 1.4 meters per second, right? So this is uh, something which uh, feels a bit difficult to comprehend that this doesn't instantly fall downwards, but this is actually what would happen. So let's say if your car is going at a speed of 80 meters per second, and if you just jump out of the door, then right at the instant you jump out, you would also be going forwards at a speed of 80 meters per second. So let me just illustrate this. So let's say this is going at a speed of 80 meters per second. And if you just jump out 
from here, at this instant, you would also be going forward at a speed of 80 meters per second, which is why it won't be pretty cool as you think it would be in movies, right? So if all of this is traveling together, so all of these objects are traveling, right? So if you are sitting in your car and you feel that you're stationary, but actually you are traveling at the same speed as the car. So this is actually a pretty cool uh, theory, which uh, Newton uh, and Einstein also worked a lot on. So this is just a very oversimplified version of relativity. Anyway, back to the question. So this block is moving upwards at a speed of 1.4 meters per second, and then it goes back down. So this is the scenario we have. I think we can erase this now. This is of no use to us now. So let's make a simpler diagram. So this is moving upwards at this instant with a speed of 1.4 meters per second, right? And then what's going to happen is then it hits the ground with a speed of 3.6 meters per second. Assume that the air resistance on the block is negligible by considering the motion of the block after the string breaks, calculate the height of the block above the ground when the string breaks. So basically what we really need to calculate, so this is the point where the string broke, right? So we need to calculate this distance. Now there's actually a fine lining here. So the thing you need to remember is, so let's say if you're talking about the equations of motion we have to use. So let's just identify what pieces of information we have. So we have the initial velocity, right? That would be this value. We have the final velocity, that would be this value. And we need to find the height above the ground. So we also know that we also have the acceleration, which in this case would be the acceleration due to the gravity. But the problem here is this. If you take this sort of a sign convention, where you say, all right, I'm going to take velocities upwards as positive, velocities downwards as negative. So if you take this as positive 1.4, this is negative 3.6. So the problem was, would be this. And obviously, A would also be negative. So this would be negative 9.81 since it's downwards. So the problem is this that would actually give you all of this distance which is traveled by the block, right? That would be this upward distance, this downward distance, and this distance. So think about it, you only actually just need this distance. So if, if I'm thinking about the block, uh, the block traveling, so if at this point it's traveling with an upward speed of 1.4, so I can say that exactly at this point, when it's coming downwards, its speed would also be 1.4, but this time it would be traveling downwards, right? So this is just me recognizing what distance do I actually need to find. If the examiner asked me calculate the total distance traveled by the block, then I would actually do this, right? But since I just need the height of the block above the ground when the string breaks. So I just need this distance, right? So I can say this, that when the block is coming down here again, it's going to be traveling with the same speed, but in a different direction. So using these vectors, I can now figure out what I actually need to calculate. So this time out, and I'm going to use this sign convention. And let me just erase this because we figured out that this is not something we want to do at the moment, right? This is, what, this is not what the question is asking us. So here, what I'm going to do is if I think about it, I have this downwards as well. This vector, this velocity is downwards as well. The acceleration due to gravity would be downwards as well. So since everything I have is downwards, let me just add this point. So I'm taking velocities or any vector for that matter, pointing downwards to be positive, 
right? So just avoiding the unnecessary negative signs. So u, the initial velocity at this point is going to be positive 1.4. The final velocity is going to be positive 3.6. The acceleration here, because this is downwards as well. So according to our sign convention, this would be positive 9.81 as well, right? So which equation of motion are we going to use if we need to calculate the height? So obviously this means S. So we can use the third equation of motion, which is V square equals U square plus two AS. So 3.6 square equals 1.4 square plus two, two times 9.81 times S. So from here we can calculate S. So S turns out to be 0 0.5606. So just to 2SF, 0 0.56 meters. Right, so this identification that which distance was actually required is crucial in solving this part. In my opinion, this one uh, was even trickier than the last question, the last part we did. Now let's go on to the last part of this question. The string breaks at time t equals to zero and the block hits the ground at time t equals to capital T. On figure 2.2, sketch a graph to show the variation of the velocity v of the block with time t, with time t from time t equals to zero to t equals capital T. Numerical values are not required. Numerical values of t are not required but you would have to mark numerical values of V as you can see by this marked Y axis. Assume that V is positive in the upward direction. So we can see that initially it was traveling uh, upwards with a speed of 1.4 meters per second for some uh, time. So we are told that we have to take V upwards, uh, V positive in the upward direction. So initially, at time t equals to zero, it would have a velocity, a speed of 1.4, right? Actually, this is velocity, not speed. So this is going to be taken as 1.4. So if I mark 1.4 on this graph, <clears throat> so if I look here, so I have a difference of five units, uh, a difference of one unit spread over five boxes. So each box, is 0.2. So this is 0.2 and this is 0.4. So this is 1.4. Somewhere here. And at the end of the day, when it hits the ground, so that is the final time, t equals to capital T, it was traveling at a speed of 3.6 meter per second, but that was downwards. So if we take V as positive in the upward direction, so we take, so obviously this means that V is going to be negative in the downward direction. So the final velocity would be negative 3.6. So this is 3.2, this is 3.4, this is 3.6. So, So this would be somewhere here. So I just then join these points for the straight line. So from here, all the way to here, right? And if you just remember the features of a velocity time graph, so the gradient of a velocity time graph is uh, acceleration. And in this case, it's the acceleration due to gravity. And this gradient is negative because as per our sign convention, uh, since vectors downwards are negative and acceleration due to gravity is downwards, so this is why the gradient of the graph is also negative. So this is where we see all this information actually coming together. So now this question is done as well. Let's go on to question three.
So question three says, Just a second, I think screen sharing is stuck again. What depends on the direction? Are you talking about, I mean, what are you talking about? What depends on the direction? Yeah, the graph uh, on the direction, right? So not the direction of travel, but the direction of the velocity, right? So if it was, for example, so if it was consistently going upwards, then the velocity would always be positive, right? But, and this is just according to the sign convention the examiner mentioned. But here, if you think about this, uh, the object was coming down as well. So if velocity is upwards or positive, so velocity is downwards would be negative. That's the answer to question. Let's start with question three. So question number three of the same paper. So the first part says state what is meant by the center of gravity of an object. So this is something we've also looked at in the past, which is simply the point through which the entire weight of entire weight of an object may be assumed to act. Right? Assumed, if you don't write this word, either assumed or taken or supposed to act, you won't get the mark. Because this is not the a point through which actually the weight acts. This is just something we suppose uh, to make our calculations just a bit easier. Part B, a uniform beam AB is attached by a frictionless hinge to a vertical wall at end A, right? So this is the beam and this is where it's attached to the wall. The beam is held so that it is horizontal by a metal wire CD. The beam is of length 0 0.96 meters and weight 23 Newton. So in a question like this, where you have so much information to unpack, so it's better that you read the question slowly. And if need be, you just go back to the top and start reading it again, right? Just to make sure that you don't miss out on anything. So this was a uniform beam AB, right? So for a uniform object, the center of gravity is right in the center. So if I'm talking about this, so if this is a beam, which is uniform, and has a length of 0 0.96 meters. So this weight would be acting through its center of gravity. And this center of gravity would actually be right in the middle. So this distance would be half of 0. Point. So half of 0 0.96, right? Because uh, 0 0.96 is this entire length. So half of 0 0.96, uh, which is 0 0.48, is going to be this distance. Let's continue. A block of weight W rests on, uh, rests on the beam at a distance of 0 0.2 meters from NB, right? So this is where the block is. The wire is attached to the beam at point D, which is a distance of 0 0.4 meters from NB. Right, so this distance from D to B is 0 0.4 meters. The wire exerts a force on the beam of 45 Newton at an angle of 37 degrees to the horizontal. So this force, this tension in the wire is acting at a distance of 37 degrees. To the horizontal, the beam is in equilibrium. 
right? So for equilibrium, we know we have two conditions, which is that the total force acting on such an object must be zero, as well as the total moment, right? So the first part says calculate the vertical component of the force exerted by the wire on the beam. So this is going to be the vertical component, right? So the horizontal component is, uh, is actually the component with the angle. So this must be cos. So by the reverse argument, this must be sine, right? So the vertical component would be 45 sine 37, right? So if you calculate this correct to 2SF, this turns out to be 27 newtons. By taking moments about A, right? So we have to consider this as our pivot. Calculate the weight W of the block. So if I think about it, there are three forces acting here, right? There is going to be this 23 Newton force and the distance of this we know. There's going to be the weight of the block. And again, I am calculating all distances uh, from A because the equation told me to use to take moments about the point A, and there would be this force as well. So if you think about it, if we just resolve these uh, this force into its components, so there would be a, let me just do this. Second. So this would be the vertical component of the force. This would be its horizontal component. So the vertical component would be 45 sine 37 as we calculated. And the horizontal component would be 45 cos 37. Obviously this force would not be producing any moment because moment is given by force times perpendicular distance from the pivot. This force, if I think about it, this force is actually passing through the pivot. So it doesn't have any perpendicular distance, right? So the moment produced by this component would be zero. On the other hand, this vertical component, and this is why the examiner actually made us calculate this, this would have a moment, right? Because there's this force, and this is the perpendicular distance from the pivot. So now if we think about uh, the principle of moments, right? So I can say that there are going to be three forces acting. So there's this one. And now it's important that I identify which force produces which type of a moment, right? So the first one, which is this 23 Newton force. And again, the way in which you figure out the uh, direction of moment produced is you just take the head of the force and rotate it about the pivot, right? In our case, the pivot is point A. So if I just rotate this, so this is producing a clockwise moment. If I talk about this force, so if I take it and rotate it about the pivot, this is an anti-clockwise moment. And then this force, the weight, is also going to be clockwise, right? So I have two forces which are producing clockwise moments and one force which is producing a anti-clockwise moment, right? So if I think about this, so first of all, obviously, by taking moments about A, so since this is an equilibrium, I would say that total anti-clockwise moment would equal the total clockwise moment, right? This is just the principle of moments. So the anti-clockwise moment, so that is this force times this distance. So 45 sine 37, this is actually 27, what we calculated, times this distance. So that would be 27 times 0 
and then the clockwise moment. So the total clockwise moment would be the sum of these individual clockwise moments. So the moment produced by this force. So 0.48 times 23. plus the other clockwise moment, which is this force times this distance. So this is 0.56, this is 0.2. So this would make up a total of 0.76 times this uh, force W. So W times 0.76. So if I just solve for W now, so this becomes 0 0.76 W equals 27 times 0 0.56 minus 23 times 0 0.48. So this is 4.08. So divide this by 0 0.76. This turns out to be 5.37 Newtons. Right? So 5.37 correct to 4 SF, uh, correct to 2 SF, this is 5.4 Newtons. The next part, the hinge exerts a force on the beam at end A. Calculate the horizontal component of this force. So, there is only one horizontal force here, which is this one. So, this is the force exerted by the beam on the hinge. So, by Newton's third law, the hinge would exert an equal and opposite force on the beam. Right, so the value of that would be just 45 cos 37. So 45 cos 37. This is 35.9. So just to 2 SF, this would be 36. Let's go on to the next part now. <clears throat> so the next part. Just a second, guys. The reason I've used the vertical component in part two is that it's the only one which would produce a moment, right? The other one would not produce a moment because that is passing through the pivot. I just explained that. Right? The vertical one is only going to produce a moment because that is the component which actually has some perpendicular distance from the pivot. The other one, the horizontal component is passing through the pivot. So it will not produce any moment.
So this is the part we were looking at, which is that the block is now placed closer to point D on the beam. State whether this change will increase, decrease, or have no effect on the tension in the wire. So if the block is now placed, so if the block is now placed closer to point D, right? So what's going to happen? So if I think about this, this block, if this is now going to be placed closer to the beam, to, uh, closer to point A, right? So if I think about it in my calculation that I just did, so this was contributing to the clockwise moment, right? So if this is being moved closer to point uh, A, so this distance would reduce. And since this distance would reduce, what would happen is that this clockwise moment would reduce, right? And since the clockwise moment is going to reduce because this is still in equilibrium, right? So let me just write the explanation for this here. So clockwise moment would reduce. And actually, let me just move one step before. So distance of W reduces, right? Because it's now being moved closer to point A. So the clockwise moment reduces. And since it would still be in balance, the anti-clockwise moment would reduce as well. And if I go back to the equation, the anti-clockwise moment That was due to the tension, right? So this was due to some component of the tension. So if this uh, anti-clockwise moment has to reduce, obviously the distance cannot change. So this force must reduce, right? So if I call this tension T, so T, uh, T sine 37 must reduce. So obviously then T should reduce as well. So T must reduce. So this will decrease the tension in the wire. Right? The last part of this question, the, strength, uh, the stress in the wire is 5.3 into 10 to the 7. So stress we know is the... Hey. So stress we know is the force acting perpendicularly to a unit area. So the stress is given by this value. The wire is now replaced by a second wire that has a radius which is three times greater than that of the original wire. The tension in the wire is unchanged. Calculate the stress in the second wire. Now there are a couple of ways to do this and uh, the method you may adopt may be slightly different, but again, the answer will be the same. So here, if I think about it, the tension in the wire is unchanged, right? So I can say that the stress is inversely proportional to the area. Right? So if I think about this, and here I actually don't know what's happening to the area, I know what's happening to the radius, right? So the area of this wire, since the examiner has used the word radius, so I would just assume, and this is actually a perfect assumption, which is that this must be a circle. So if this area is pi r square, so I can also say, so instead of area, if I just write pi r square, so pi is a constant as well. If I'm just talking about proportionality, I can get rid of this as well. So sigma, uh, the stress is just inversely proportional to r square, right? So this radius of the new wire is three times greater than that of the original wire. So if this value, if the radius is being multiplied by three, Right? So if this is increasing by 3, then by the inverse proportion, the stress must decrease by 9. 
right? Because this is a square. So if one thing increases by, so if the radius is increasing by three times of its original value, so this is an inverse proportion. Uh, this is an inverse proportion. So this must decrease by three square, which is nine times of its original value. So the new stress would simply be the old stress divided by nine. So this value turns out to be 5.9 into 10 to the six. Actually, this is 5.88, but just to two SF, this is 5.9. Right? Just give me a second, guys. So let me know if you have any questions, otherwise we move on to questions four. There are actually multiple ways to do this question. Another uh, one could have been this. So if you don't talk about proportion right of the hand. So uh, let me just discuss this. So another way to do this question could have been this. So let's say you say that the stress is 5.3 into 10 to the 7 when the radius is r. And you need to calculate the stress when the radius is 3R, right? This is actually what you have to do. So just another way, and this is just the uh, difference in the mathematical approach. So you could use the fact that the tension in the wire, which is actually what is causing the stress. So if this is unchanged, so you can also say that sigma, the stress times A is a constant, right? So you can say sigma A is a constant. So sigma times A, that means that one set of values. So 5.3 into 10 to the seven into the radius. So 5.3 into 10 to the seven into the area. So the area corresponding to a radius of R would be pi R square should equal the product of the radius and the the product of the stress and the area at uh, another value. So this new sigma, the new stress is what you need to find. And the area corresponding to this would be pi times 3 R square. Right? So this would actually lead to the same conclusion. So this would be 5.3 into 10 to the 7 into pi R square equals sigma times nine pi r square, right? Pi's cancel, r squares cancel. So again, you get the same thing that the new sigma, the new stress is 5.3 into 10 to the seven upon nine. But I would also recommend being really strong with uh, inverse and direct proportions because uh, a lot of questions are asked uh, in MCQs related to these. Question number four. A horizontal spring is fixed at one end. A block, is, a block is pushed against the other end of the spring so that the spring is compressed. The block is released and accelerates along a horizontal frictionless surface as the spring returns to its original length. 
the block leaves the end of the spring with a speed of 2.3 meters per second as shown in figure 4.2. Right, so this uh, entire thing is shown. So the spring is first compressed, right? So this is what is used to give the block some velocity, right? So as this is released, uh, the block is propelled uh, by the spring and that uh, causes it to gain a speed of 2.3 meters per second. On to the actual questions. The block has a mass of 250 grams and the spring has a spring constant of 420 Newton per meter. Assume that the spring always obeys Hooke's law and that all the elastic potential energy of the spring is transferred to the kinetic energy. Calculate the kinetic energy of the block as it leaves the spring. So kinetic energy we know is given by half mv square. So the mass is going to be, and let me just also show you the answer space so you can decide for yourself what to keep in the units. So since this is in joules, this is a standard unit of energy. So all the other things, the masses and the velocities must be in SI units as well. This is not in SI units right now. So 250 upon 1000, to convert this into kg, so basically 0 0.250, is the mass and the speed was 2.3. So the square of 2.3. So from this, if you calculate the kinetic energy, so correct to 2 SF, this turns out to be 0 0.66 joules. We multiplied A with sigma because we said that force is constant, right? Calculate the compression of the spring immediately before the block is released. So in this one, you have to use this fact that all the elastic potential energy of the spring is transferred to the kinetic energy. So this is uh, basically the principle of conservation of energy, but this is just uh, spelled out for you. So whatever the kinetic energy of the block is, must have been the elastic potential energy, right? So the elastic potential energy should also be 0 0.66. And since we know the spring constant, so I would use this particular variant of the energy, half kx square, right? So I need to calculate the compression, right? You can call this the compression or the extension. Just remember that it means a change in length. So according to this, uh, so 0 0.66 equals half times k, which is 420 times x square. So you just calculate uh, x from here, so 0 0.66 times 2 divided by 420 under the root. This turns out to be 0 0.05606, so just 0 0.056 meters connect, uh, correct to 2SF. After leaving the spring, the block moves along the surface and until it hits a barrier at a speed of 2.3. So whatever speed it had right when it was propelled by the spring, it continues to move with the same speed. And this actually uh, complies with the fact above uh, when the examiner said that this is a frictionless surface, right? So it continues to move at the same speed until it hits the barrier. The block then rebounds at a speed of 1.5 meters per second and moves back along its original path. The block is in contact with the barrier for a time of 0 0.086 seconds. So, so if this is the kind of scenario you have, so the block is initially moving towards the wall, the barrier, at a speed of 2.3, but then it rebounds along the from the barrier with a speed of 1.5, right? So rebound obviously means that it's coming back at you. First, it was moving away from me, now it's coming back at you. So this is how I labeled these directions. So this is given, uh, the block is in contact with the barrier for a time of 0 0.086 seconds. 
So to calculate the change in momentum of the block, so the change in momentum is the final momentum minus the initial momentum. But keep in mind here, uh, this thing that momentum is a vector, right? So in vectors, velocities matter. So just like a normal kinematics question, I would also have to establish a sign convention here. Again, for no uh, special reason, I'm saying that velocities towards the right are positive, velocities towards the left are negative. So when I'm actually calculating momentum, I would say that this velocity is positive because it's to the right, and therefore this velocity is negative. So mv minus mu, so the mass was given that this mass is 250 grams, so basically 0.25 kgs. So 0.25 times the final velocity because I'm calculating the final momentum. So let me actually write, uh, write this in symbols first. So this would be mv, right? Mass times final velocity minus mass times initial velocity. So 0 0.25 is the mass times the final velocity, which is negative 1.5 minus the mass times initial velocity, which is 2.3, right? This would be the change in momentum. Again, here, since the examiner is, uh, and obviously this change in momentum, the sign of this depends on the sign convention you've adopted. So whenever giving the answer, you can just uh, leave out the negative sign. Even if you write it, the examiner will not deduct marks, but it's better not to write it. So this turns out to be negative 0 0.95. So change would just be 0 0.95, right? The next part, the average resultant force exerted on the block. So here we would use this equation that force is the rate of change of momentum. So the change in momentum above was 0 0.95 and this change in momentum occurred over a time of 0 0.086 seconds. So using this, we can get the force. So this turns out to be 11.04 or just to 2 SF 11 Newtons. On to the last part. The maximum compression X of the spring is now varied in order to vary the kinetic energy of the block as it leaves the spring. Assume that all the elastic potential energy in the spring is always transferred to the kinetic energy of the block. So this is something we assumed above as well, which is that the entire kinetic energy is transferred into elastic potential energy. So we need to now plot the graph of the maximum compression versus the kinetic energy. So here, if I think about the elastic potential energy that is given by this equation, right? And this is my kinetic energy. So this value is on my y-axis and this thing is on my x-axis. So if I think about this, half k, this entire thing is just a constant. Right? And this thing is actually what I have on my y-axis. This thing, x, is what I have on my x-axis. So this will look like a quadratic curve, right? And the basic shape you need to remember for a quadratic curve is this. So a simple shape of y equals x squared is what you need to remember for your A-level physics exam. So that shape would be something like this, actually, something of this sort. So since here you are just drawing this on the right-hand side of uh, the x-axis, so you would just draw this shape. So that would simply be a curve like this with an increasing gradient. 
So that concludes this question. Now let's go on to question number five. So question number five, part A says two progressive sound waves meet to form a stationary wave. The two waves have the same amplitude, wavelength, frequency, and speed. State the other condition that must be fulfilled by the two waves in order for them to produce the stationary wave. So the only other condition is this, that they must be moving in opposite directions, right? So must be moving. in opposite directions. The next part, a stationary wave is formed on a string that is stretched between two fixed points A and B. Figure 5.1 shows the string at time t equals to zero when each point is at its maximum displacement. Right, so all these points, which are actually displaced, are at their maximum displacement. So what this means is if this point is here, so it won't go in this direction anymore, right? This point would move upwards. Similarly, this point is also not going to move upwards anymore. At this point, it is just going to move downwards, right? So the distance AB is given as 0 0.8 meters. The period of the stationary wave is 0 0.016 seconds. On figure 5.1 sketch a solid line to show the position of the string at time t equals to 0 0.004 seconds. So if I think about this time as a fraction of this, so this is one fourth of this thing. So this is basically one fourth of the time period later, what would happen? Right, because this is time t equals to zero. So what would happen after a quarter of a time period? So keep in mind that this is a stationary wave, not a progressive wave. So this wave is not going to actually move from left to right. Right, so you know that the way this would move is that these peaks would move in opposite directions like this. Right, so only a quarter of a time period later, this would move downwards by this much. This would move upwards by this much. So actually what you would have is a line like this, right? So exactly a horizontal line from A to B. No displacement of any particle. So I'm going to label this line as P, right? And this is a bit difficult to show on this, but you should have a very good grip on this as to how the stationary waves are formed, right? So if you just pick up your books and if you think about uh, how the stationary waves are formed and what are the phase differences basically of the uh, two waves which are forming the stationary waves, so you will you would understand as to why you have a horizontal line here. At time t equals to 0 0.024 seconds. So if I think about this again in uh, terms of the time period, so 0 0.016 is one full time period, right? So after 0 0.016 seconds, I would have this exact shape. So after 0 0.016, I have another half of a time period, right? So between 0 0.024 and 0 0.016, I have 0 0.008, which is actually two, uh, sorry, not two, which is actually half a time period. So half a time period later, what would happen is just like this, that so a quarter of a time period later, again, both of these would be moving in opposite directions. So that at 0 0.02 seconds, you would have this exact horizontal line. And another quarter of a time period after this, these would be moving in this direction, right? Both would be moving in opposite directions. 
So here the graph would be something like this. So this is how Q would look like, right? So this is really important that you understand how stationary waves are formed. Even though in the syllabus, it's, it looks like it's just one line, but you can have really tricky questions in both P1 and P2 related to these. So it's important to understand uh, how these are formed and also the different variations in the time period. Determine the speed of a progressive wave along the string. Right, so this is the equation for wave speed which we have. So if I think about this, I know that the period of uh, the stationary wave is this, right? So I can calculate uh, the frequency from this. So that would simply be one upon 0 0.016 times lambda, right? So the wavelength here. So again, uh, for the stationary waves, you need to remember that the distance between any two adjacent nodes or anti-nodes, right? So Objects with uh, the points with zero displacement are called nodes. So if you think about all the three waveforms we have, this point, this point, this point, this, or this point actually have no displacement, right? This is, so just joining the first two uh, letters of each of these words together, no displacement, you make the word node. So nodes have no displacement. So the distance between any two adjacent nodes or anti-nodes, so just like nodes have no displacement, anti-nodes have maximum displacement. So that is half the wavelength. So this distance is half the wavelength. This is again half, half, and half. So this entire distance is two wavelengths of this wave, right? So if AB is 0 0.80, so I would say that two lambda is 0 0.80. So lambda would simply be 0 0.80 upon two. So from here, we can calculate uh, the wave speed. So 0 0.8 upon 0 0.016 times two. So this turns out to be exactly 25 meters per second. I can see this lagging, but I don't seem to understand why this is the case. <clears throat> Let's go on to the next part. So now it seems to be better. No, it's not better. Let me change the network. So a beam of vertically polarized. Let's just wait for screen sharing to work. So a beam of vertically polarized light of intensity I naught is incident normally on a polarizing filter that has its transmission axis at 30 degrees to the vertical as shown in figure 5.2. Right now, so if I think about the vertically polarized light, and we've also talked about this in the previous paper we did, which is that this is coming exactly in a vertical direction. 
and it's hitting the uh, filter like this, right? So the trans, uh, so this first filter is actually at at uh, so its axis is at thirty degrees to the vertical. So what this means is that the wave emerging from this uh, filter is going to be like this. Right, so this is how the wave would look like when it's at 30 degrees. So this was exactly vertically incident. This is going to be incident. Uh, this wave is going to be like this. So this is going to be at an angle of 30 degrees to the vertical as well. And that's exactly how it's going to strike the second filter. Right. So let's take it step by step. The transmitted light from the first polarizing filter has intensity I1. This light is then incident normally on a second polarizing filter that's ha that has its transmission axis at 90 degrees to the vertical, right? So this uh, transmission axis was like this, and this transmission axis is at 90 degrees to the vertical. The transmitted light from the second filter has intensity I2. So this is I0, this is I1, this is I2. Calculate the ratio I1 upon I0. So if I think about I1 upon I0, so I know that this equation I have is I equals I0 cos square theta. This is also known as Malice's law. So here, uh, this I is really just I0, right? Because this is the, sorry. So this I0 is I0, right? So this is the intensity which is striking this filter. And I, uh, this I is the uh, intensity is the intensity of the beam which is transmitted, right? Which is coming out of this filter. So I can just write it like this, so I upon I1. So if I have to uh, calculate I1 upon I0, so that we know is simply cos square theta. So if we think about theta here, and although this part is really simple, but you must always remember that theta, this angle is the angle between the intensity and the transmission axis, right? So here the intensity was vertically incident. So the intensity would be like this. The transmission axis is like this. So the angle between them is 30. So cos 30 squared, right? So cos 30 squared, this turned out to be 0.75. As the ratio of I one upon I naught, right? The next part is actually uh, a bit trickier, which is cos uh, the ratio I two upon I naught. So how are I two and I naught linked? So obviously, Malice's law only tells me uh, tells me the relationship between the intensity striking and the intensity being emitted. Right, so I can find now the relationship between I1 and I2, but since I already know the relationship between I1 and I0, I can also calculate the ratios of I0 and I2. Anyway, so first let's talk about this. So this part is important to identify that since, uh, and what the transmission axis really shows is now that this intensity is at an angle of 30 degrees to the vertical to the vertical. So when I'm talking about the second transmission, uh, the second uh, transmission axis, the second filter, this wave would be, the intensity would be arriving at this angle, right? At 30 degrees. So in this case, if I think about this, the transmission axis is now vertical. So actually when I'm now going to calculate cos theta, the angle I should use is this one. So always remember in Malice's law that the angle is between the intensity, which is incident and the transmission axis. And now if I think about this, the axis, uh, the, sorry, the intensity which should now be coming out from this uh, filter would now actually be just like flat down on its face like this. Right? Because the transmission axis is perfectly horizontal. 
So here, obviously, if this angle be one and blue is 30, this must be a right angle, right? So this angle in purple must be 60 degrees. So when I'm talking about I1 and I2, so here I'm going to say that by Malice's law, the transmitted uh, intensity I2 should be I1 times cos square theta. So I2 upon I1 would be cos 60 square. So cos 60 is half and the square of that would be 0 0.25. So when I'm talking about the ratio I2 upon I0, so I can simply see from the fractions here that if I multiply these as well, the I1s would cancel out. So when I'm talking about the ratio I2 upon I0, that would simply be I2 upon I1 times I1 upon I0. So I2 upon I1 is 0.25 i1 upon i0 is 0 0.75 so the product of this this turns out to be 0 0.1875 or just to 2sf 0 I don't know why we're so slow today. Let's do question six quickly. So question six says define electric potential difference. So this is potential difference. So this is the work done by a unit charge. from electrical to other forms while going through or while passing through a component. So this, uh, the way I've written this is, this is probably a bit of an overkill. You can just talk about either the energy transferred from electrical to other forms, or you can take the work done approach by a unit charge as it passes through a component. A battery is connected to two resistors X and Y as shown in figure 6.1. The resistance of resistor X is greater than the resistance of resistor Y. State and explain which resistor dissipates more power. Now there are two ways to do this uh, to do this question. So the first is to realize that this is a series circuit, right? So there must be the same current flowing through both of these. Let's call that current I. So if I think about the current, the current would be the same, but the resistance of resistor X is greater than the resistance of resistor Y. So Rx is greater than Ry. State and explain which resi uh, resistor dissipates more power. So since I'm using uh, the current, so I can use this particular variant of uh, the power formula I square R. So since the current flowing through both of them would be the same, so I can say that for X, So since the current in both of them is the same, since Rx is greater, P equals I square R. So since the current is the same, this power across X, the power dissipated across X would be greater as well. Right? So this is one way you can talk about this. So since the current is the same, but the resistance of X is larger, so by P equals I square R, the power dissipated across X would be larger as compared to the power across Y. The other way is if you talk about 
the voltages. So let's say this voltage across X. So let me just erase this for a second. So let's say that the voltage across X, let's say this is VX. And let's say the voltage across Y, this is VY. So again, we can talk about the same fact that since uh, the resistance of X is greater than the resistance of Y, right? So here, if I talk about the voltages, then I would use the this formula V square upon R, right? And here I would explain this in this way. So since the resistor of X, uh, the resistance of X is greater than the resistance of Y. So the voltage across this would be greater than the voltage across this one, right? And actually, sorry, so I wouldn't use V square upon R because here the voltage across both of these would be different. The resistance would also be different. So this makes it quite complicated to look at this without values. So instead I would use V equals VI. So this is like a kind of a good tip for yourself that whenever you're doing such parts related to power, use the formula in which you have one thing constant and the other thing is changing, right? So I can't use V square upon R so because the V would be different as well. R would be different as well. So the more convenient thing to be uh, looking at would be VI. So since the resistance of X is greater than the resistance of Y, so the potential divide, uh, the potential division tells us that the voltage across X would be greater than the voltage across Y as well. So this would be, so if I talk about this, so if I talk about X, so since VX is greater and P equals VI, and again, the current is the same, since V is greater, so the power across X would be greater as well. So these are two different ways of reaching the same conclusion. Always in power formula, try to use the uh, variant of the formula in which you have one thing constant. A battery of EMF nine volts and internal resistance R is connected to two resistors P and Q as shown in figure 6.2. So this is the uh, battery which actually has some internal resistance and then you have two resistors connected in parallel. Again, the nine volts would not be appearing across both of these because of this drop against the across the internal resistance. A total charge of 650 coulombs moves, moves through resistor P in a time interval of 540 seconds. So if I just put symbols to these numbers here, so this would be Q, this would be time. During this time, uh, the resistor P dissipates 4,800 joules of energy. So there's, uh, this would be energy, so this would be E, right? So this would be E. The current in the resistor is 4.5 amperes. Assume that the EMF of the battery remains constant. Calculate the current in resistor P. So we can simply use current as the rate of flow of charge, right? So a charge of 650 flows in a time of 540 seconds. So from this, we can get uh, the current, which is 1.2 amperes. The next part, the potential difference across resistor P, right? So across resistor P, if we think about uh, what we have, so for resistor P, what we just calculated is we calculate the current through it. Right, and we also know that the uh, the resistor dissipates forty eight hundred joules of energy. So how about this? That we use uh, V equals W upon Q because th that is what potential difference is really. This is the work done per unit charge. So the work done is forty eight hundred, and how much charge flows? That is six fifty. So 4,800 upon 650, this would be the potential difference across P, this would be 
volts. Or another possible solution could be this, that if you talk about the energy, electrical energy formula, so if you use E equals V I T, right? So you can also use this to calculate uh, the power. So here, the voltage, also you actually don't know the voltage. So the voltage is what you need to calculate. So yeah, you can't use this one either. Yeah, you can't do this yet. So this is the only method you have. So this is the potential difference across P. And we know the same potential difference, which is across P. So this 7.4. So the 7.4 would be appearing across these as well, across these as well, and across this resistor as well, right? So here we now need to calculate the value of the internal resistance R. So if I think about this, uh, this 7.4 is basically the terminal potential difference, right? So this would be the EMF of the battery minus the current times the internal resistance of the battery. The only problem is, is that even though I know EMF, I don't know the current flowing through the battery. But if I think about this, I know the current flowing through, the, through resistor P, this is 1.2. So this value is 1.2. So if I just use uh, Kirchhoff's law, I can figure out the current flowing in this loop and then that would be the current flowing through the battery as well. So current flowing into a junction equals current flowing out. So current flowing in is what I need to find. Current flowing out is 1.2 plus 4.5. So the current would be 1.2 plus 4.5. 1.2 plus 4.5. So this would be 5.7. So now if I think about it, 7.4 is what I know. E is the EMF of the battery, which was 9 minus 5.7 times small r. So from here, you can just calculate small r. So 9 minus 7.4 divided by 5.7. So R turns out to be 0 0.28 ohms correct to 2SF. So the uh, still one question is left, but I also have another class after this. So for that one, you can just have a look at the recording, which is question number seven, right? Any questions you have, you can just post on the platform and somebody will be sure to get back to you, right? So thanks for your time, guys, and see you in the next session, uh, which will be on the day after tomorrow, right? No, sorry, so not after, so not the day after tomorrow because of Eid, uh, probably after that. So thanks for your time, guys, and see you in the next session. Thanks and bye-bye.